Okay, so we are back. Uh, now we are just to continue with the uh, different talks uh, for seeing for this afternoon. And the first one is uh, Armando Gil de Paz. Uh, the title is uh, Tarsis uh, Tetra Arm Super IFU Spectra. Armando, go ahead. Thank you very much, Jesus. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming to the virtual talk. I am going to, to share my screen. Hopefully, it will work right away. Okay. Yeah, okay. I think this one, okay. Okay, yeah, now we see it. Yeah. Okay, we can see you. Now we see it. Okay, now I, let me just click here. It should be ready. Okay. Okay. Let's give some seconds to the internet connection. Okay, there it is. Okay, so is everybody ready? So I start already? Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. So, well, today I'm going to present the instrumental effort that is uh, uh, accompany that accompanies the the survey catharsis that Patricia will present right after me. So, the first question is, what is Tarsis? That's of, co of course our logo. And uh, well, Tarsis has a long tradition. It's already mentioned in the Bible. There were some boats that were sent by the Phoenicians all the way to the Mediterranean with. Uh, Difficult destiny, and also they were especially prepared for long trips. Actually, that's one of the reasons why the, all the colonies in the south of Spain and Andalusia were founded by the Phoenicians, thanks to the Tarsis ship boats. And then also Tarsis, I hear some background noise, so would you mind putting that noise in mute? Thank you very much. So also the Tarsis it was a, the, the believed to be the capital of the Tartessos, which is a large uh, region, almost an empire at the well, uh, before the, the Romans, of course, that was the, the map of the Tartessos and Tarsis were, was their capital. By the way, the, the first king of Tartessos was Herion, which is actually the one giant with several heads and several bodies, and is actually the, the symbol of Herion, is the, also the logo of uh, our instrument. And it's also a city in Huelva, in the south of Huelva, although it has an H on it, but it's also the same thing. It's also, of course, the, one of the main volcanic areas in Mars, and, and it's also a, a ball game. But the important part is that Tarsis is an instrument for the 3.5 meters, which I think will revolutionize the stratigraphic astronomy, but also galactic astronomy. And I think it should be the definitive uh, instrument to be chosen for the 3.5 meters for this call. Uh, this is an image of the envelope of the instrument already, this, uh, at the level of preliminary design, and also how it looks attached to the casting and focus of the 3.5 meters telescope. As I said, it's also uh, basically the goal, the instrument, the tool to complete the catharsis survey. Okay, so let's move on with the actual science and the actual instrumentation. Uh, I see some delay with the with the presentation, so okay, so the the, the tarsis also stands for the tetra arm super IQ spectrograph and it's a uh, in this talk, I'm basically presenting the work done by uh, Jorge Iglesias as co of the instrument, Patricia Sanchez Blasquez as the project scientist, myself, and us, of course, the Tarsis Consortium and Instrument Team and the Catarsis Survey Team. So we have a large group of people from all the institutions in the consortium and elsewhere that are contributing to science and to the instrument development. Uh, these are the requirements for our instrument. So this is a minimum spectral size. Of course, we are prioritizing the field of view here. There is also the uh, requirement for spectral resolution to be above 1,000, and the efficiency should be as high as 20%, reaching all the way to 320 nanometers, 3,200 angstroms, which is basically the real atmospheric limit, which is not the atmospheric limit that the people have assumed traditionally because Mm, traditionally, the instruments have been designed for long wavelengths, and we have an impressive field of view of almost nine square meters. Three of three, four, uh, three quarters of that field of view are covered by the uh, the blue spectrographs, three blue spectrographs, and one quarter is uh, covered by the red spectrograph. Uh, the spectral ranges of the blue spectrographs are 320 to 520. It's a UV slash U band optimized instrument and the other red spectrograph that covers the, the red range between 510 to 760 nanometers. Basically, the idea is to use this instrument within catharsis to map, uh, let's say, 0.15 uh, 
progressive clusters, and this is an example of 1940. Uh, Patricia will give more, more details on this. It will be like our first point, you know, the sequence. This is going probably going to be slow for the people following the stream, but we'll see then after the first exposure, typically we'll spend a couple of hours in each uh, rotation, then we will rotate the, the instrument uh, that has a grain ring, actually 90 degrees, then we will expose another two hours, then another 90 degrees, we'll expose another two hours, and the same thing. I don't know if you are, this is being updated as fast as in my computer. Uh, Amando. Okay, and it is. It takes a while. Amando. Can and then, know? after four pointings. Someone has left the microphone. We have the entire three yeah, by three, so almost nine square minutes, uh, cover the instrument for eight hours. So, Patricia, as I said, will give uh, more details about the, not, not only the survey strategy, but mainly the, the sample selection and the scientific objectives. Right, so they will have, as I said, the whole field of view with uh, three quarters of the exposure time uh, obtained with the blue band, which is more demanding, and one quarter with the red. Right, so in terms of, for example, H alpha to H beta ratio, it makes sense. In terms of the typical colors of uh, galaxies in these clusters, also makes sense. But in general, we have a very powerful instrument for the entire 320 to uh, 760 nanometer spectral range. So this going back to the original Cassegrain ring position angle, then we we'll finally map the uh, entire 1.5 billion radius of each of the clusters spending more or less 15, 15 points in, in each of these clusters. Okay, this is a summary. Let's see how it ends in the streaming. And the next slide is the people and institutions involved in this instrument. Basically, it's led by the Complutense University along with the IIA. And then we have also some contributions from Caralto, which is part of, part of the consortium, has been done in previously in other instruments. Uh, also, University of Granada, University of Sevilla, University of Almería, and also the Central Astrobiology as another physics institute. And we have also a major contribution from Yahweh, which is our main uh, optical designer and uh, manufacturing partner, and also private companies such as Fractal, which is also part of our consortium. Uh, we have uh, in the scientific part, this the catharsis survey and the scientific part of, of Tarsis is led by Patricia Sánchez Blasquez. And we have as co-project scientists Monica Relaño from the University of Granada and uh, Jorge Sánchez, sorry, Jorge Iglesias from IAA. Uh, besides the science to be done with catharsis, we have identified three advisory groups that are critical to ensure that the instrument will be also useful for other science and for other astronomers besides our uh, survey team, which are our galactic and local group uh, advisory group, and also the targets of opportunity advisory group. And finally, we will identify an external advisory group in addition to the ones that Caralto might identify for the, for the reviews that will also ensure that we take care of all the science that can be done with the 3.5 meters. This is a summary, in the next slide is a summary of the all the commitment letters that we have received and that have been sent to Caralto for evaluation of the different partners, including, as I said, these uh, three uh, Andalusian universities, uh, two CSIC institutes, one international uh, partner, and two private companies, including one company in Cadiz. Uh, regarding our competitors, which are, of course, extremely important because we want to be the ones that actually put 3.5 meters in terms of extragalactic astronomy back in the game, like it has been known, for example, for Califa. Uh, we have Muse, of course, which is a high, let's say, high spatial resolution version, I would say, with one square minute, with basically no coverage in the blue, and it's also not a dedicated instrument, it's a regular facility instrument. We have Blue Muse, which is still, of course, to be approved, and it should have fertilized sometime in 2026, in principle, and it covers four times less field of view that we will cover with Tarsis. And then we have Virus, which is the, the, the IFU, the large field of view IFU for the Obiability Telescope, which has a lower spectral resolution and no red coverage whatsoever. Mm. Also, it's an instrument that is designed by, uh, basically, well, not designed, but carried out by students at uh, the different universities in the US. So, therefore, the, the, the pace of producing results is much slower than should, I would say. And we have also the local volume uh, mapper, which is a much smaller telescope and also lower multiplexing. Uh, and besides all, but virus are located in the south. So there will be an entire hemisphere available for Tarsis 
and sites. We have uh, performed, thanks to the contribution of uh, the Fertile companies and uh, preliminary optical design, these are the two spectrographs, the red one from 500, uh, uh, 510 to 760 nanometers, uh, which has an angle collimator to camera of 18 degrees, and in the bottom you have the uh, UV USA spectrograph, the blue optimized one, which reaches 3, 320 all the way to 520 Armstrong. And this one has a, also a, a, a slight angle to reach our desired spectral resolution. Keep in mind that all the elements here have, I mean, are, uh, have no risk. The BPAs have a relatively comfortable uh, lines per millimeter, and also the optical apertures are within, uh, I mean, certainly lower than other instruments that have been, uh, for example, manufactured in a way, as Esperanza will show later in her talk. Uh, this is a, these are the spot diagrams in the next slide. This is for the blue spectrograph. So you can, can see we have resolution between 1000 to 1700 uh, and with a reciprocal linear dispersion of one angstrom per pixel on average. Uh, we are put, putting two slits in the same spectrograph. So that means that we double, obviously, the field of view. That's why we can reach this large field of view. This is something that, for example, was done for Pinos also in the past. So it's not. Uh, Nothing, again, no risk here. And thus, the next one is the same spot diagrams, but for the red spectrograph, for the one that covers one-fourth of the field of view, and it has, uh, is red optimized, of course. And in this case, again, we have a resolution that are uh, slightly higher, between 1,300 to 2,000, and uh, with a slightly uh, coarser sample, sampling of 0.1.2 angstroms per spectral pixel. In the next slide, uh, we have uh, the optomechanical, again, preliminary design, or in this case, it's the, for the blue spectrograph, this 14.4 uh, uh, angle between collimator and camera. Collimators on the right, cameras on the left, and the BPH is in the middle. And we have the CCD uh, is housed in a continuous flow cryostat head, similar to the one that is used for Carmen is already at Cala Alto. It's still to be seen, actually, this instrument which is located in the classic range is compatible with the continuous flow, flow cryostat configuration, but in principle, it will make everything more compact and also more easy to maintain at the observatory, of course. In the next slide, I have put the, the instrument packing already. It's the one I show at the very beginning. I'll wait just a few seconds until it appears for our friends in the streaming version of the, of the talk. So there it is, that's the, the, the four spectrographs, the three UV optimized and the red optimized, covering, as I said, this 3.3 by 3 square minutes on the sky. Uh, in terms of envelope, it's at about 2.5 meters by 1.4. 1.4 would be like the, the diameter of the, of the package itself. And uh, you can actually see it placed already at the cassette focus of the 3.5 meters in the next slide. And Let's see. Okay, there it is. So that's the how the instrument will look in, of course, of setting to the zenith with the the in focus of the 3.5 meters. In terms of detectors, as I said, we will hope to have them installed at this CCD head for continuous flow cryostats. We have identified the 23184, a Teledyne CCD, which was already used in Carmenes and also in Megara. And this instrument, this detector, has also very blue, blue uh, uh, no, <laughs> sorry, the coating has a, a, a blue optimized coating and a red optimized coating. So we have already also identified the coatings for the two different channels. We will need a deep depleted, obviously, for the blue will be the standard one. So that will also make the detectors cheaper for the blue and we will use the deep depleted for the red. And other alternatives are using 2, 2K by 4K also for Teledyne or even trying to see if in the, in the conceptual design phase we can actually increase the wavelength coverage by using a 6K by 6K. In terms of our budget, Marisa Garcia Vargas, the project manager, will discuss this in detail uh, later on. But in principle, we have a total monetary cost of 5 million euros without uh, a contingency. And in addition to that, 4 millions of uh, in-kind contribution. Uh, the contingency was estimated in 1 million euros if, if eventually is needed. But in principle, also I would like to highlight that we have uh, 4.5 million that could be already charged to the project, could be already used by the end of the 2020-2022 uh, federal funds or ERF, ERF funds. 
uh, within the packages, just let me highlight out that the detectors and cryostat have been tentatively assigned to the IIA, which amounts 1.24 million euros, uh, which is a big fraction of the project that will go, of course, to the IIA. Regarding the schedule, uh, which is the next slide, it will appear in a few seconds. Uh, we have our feasibility is expected for September 2020. Of course, it has to be negotiated with Cara Alto and with the availability of the panel. And then we will expect to have the optics PDR, also the blanks and CCD ordering by March 2020, which is what actually allow us to use all that money from the uh, current uh, federal funds uh, period. Uh, with that, we will start the manufacturing of the spectra of late 2021, and uh, the AIB will be around 2024, and the first light should be 2025, March 2025. Of course, these are tentative uh, dates, but in principle, we should be on the sky even before Blue Muse, even if Blue Muse gets accepted, of course. Uh, Marisa will give more details about the scheduling. So, so we have further to study, to basically drive the requirements for, for Tarsis, we have uh, used, uh, developed an ETC, although it's, uh, it's based on the ETC42 software done at the Laboratory of Astrophysics in Marseille, and this software allows us actually to include all the uh, specific characteristics of Tarsis to determine whether it's, uh, it fulfills our scientific requirements. We have, of course, assumed a given number of uh, components and efficiency curve, for example, also the UV attenuation for the near UV part has to be assumed from La Palma, the UV sky spectrum has very good spectral resolution, and also we have incorporated miles-based templates to this tool. Uh, for example, in this case, you can see the efficiency curve, which is very similar to the UVB uh, arm of uh, X shooter, which is also UV optimized. In the red, it will be similar, for example, to the red arm of the of the X shooter or any other state of the art spectra, for example, like Megara or anything like that. Right? Okay. The next slide is just showing another assumption for the ETC and for doing all our numbers, which is the US, the US sky spectrum for dark conditions, because it does strong requirement for at least for catharsis, which is to observe within dark conditions, because the, U, the UV and the U band is extremely bright with moon. The next slide is the transmission that has been adopted for the uh, for the atmosphere. Keep in mind that the, the extinction at 300 3,200 is about one magnitude. It's not three or four, it's just one magnitude. So as many science as Patricia will show, as Jose will show also later, that must be done in that range. And in that sense, and in many others, Tarsis will be unique. And if we go to 3,500, the thing is even better. We are talking about 0.6 magnitude. And of course, when you reach 3,800, the extinction is basically the same as 4,000. It's just that the, traditionally, the instruments have been designed for beyond 4,000. That's why they are so, they have such a poor uh, performance, for example, in the oxygen two line in emission for receive zero. That's the, the template that we have been incorporating. That's a template for elliptical, because some of these clusters, uh, of course, have members that have an elliptical uh, galaxy shape uh, SED. And with those numbers, we have obtained our requirement for observing, as I said, around uh, eight hours in total, with the four pointings included, the four rotations included for our 0.15 galaxy clusters. Uh, this is the, the resulting for that, uh, for that uh, early type system at the faintest object that we aim to, to reach. That's the, the graph of the signal to noise as a function of wavelength with the specifications of the observatory and of course of the instrument. So that's already producing real estimates of whether we can do it or not. And in the next slide is if we put another uh, template I don't see you, Jesus, but I hope that's more than a five. Yes, actually, five more minutes. Okay, okay just a five, okay, <laughs> fair enough. So, as I said, if we put a spiral galaxy template, like in this slide, we can see we can easily reach 20 signal, signal to noise ratio per pixel uh, for a star forming galaxy or a spiral galaxy like this one. So, certainly we have margin there, but even for the early types that dominate some of these clusters. For even higher receive, this is uh, the numbers that we will get for a 1.6 Lyman alpha meter that will be in our fields. As Jose will, will discuss later, we can reach 5, 10 to the 17 Earths per centimeter squared in Lyman alpha line with a signature of 3 in, in our typical catharsis exposures. 
And the final one is uh, so as an example of we can, can, what can be done, which is besides catharsis. So I'm just putting two examples. One is uh, what can be done, for example, in the local group in M31 and 33 Of course, even better if we do it in the in our own galaxy. But in principle, we should be able to read this signal to noise of 30 at obvious stars in M31 and 33 in about one hour. And we are reaching 300, uh, sorry, 320 nanometers. And there are many features for this kind of star that are critical to reach, and people have been able to reach at least in massive numbers like Atarsis will provide. Another example, all of this is actually uh, cases that are provided by our uh, advisory groups, the Galactic One and also the Tangent Opportunity. This is uh, the famous NGC 4993, which is the first optical counterpart of a gravitational wave, which should be appear for our streaming guys in just a second, like this. And in this galaxy, of course, uh, you never know where the object is going to be located because it's not related with the star formation, so it could be anywhere. And with our uh, catharsis instrument, we will be able to target the highest probability targets of the uh, gravitational wave counterparts and be sure that we are the first one to get the spectrum. We not, might not be the first one to actually know that that's the, the source, but certainly we can go back and see that we are the first to take the the first spectrum of this target because we will do spectroimaging without taking a spectrum of the whole field at the same time. So let me just uh, uh, summarize, and I think this is important. We spell, I spent my last two minutes in here, and is that Tarsis, as I try to show you, and I hope the next talk will further demonstrate, is a unique instrument, and it will be able to do a frontier science, and that's because it's, a, it's an ambitious instrument, and certainly is a, it will be a major uh, revolution for the science that is, can be produced from Cadalto uh, on the, the 3.5 meters. And it's on not only frontier science for catharsis, as Patricia will show, but also it goes beyond, because to galactic science, it's got to tie this opportunity, so it has many applications that I think the entire uh, Spanish community, which is the one that has access to the, to the telescopes, could enjoy not only the, the time warranty time associated to the project, but also, and more importantly, the time that goes after that, because this instrument should last for at least one to two decades, hopefully. Uh, it covers a wide range. It has a, a spectrum as optimized for the blue and reaching all the way to 3,200 3, Armstrong and all the way to the really first deep telluric absorption band, which is at 600, 760 nanometers. And it provides a uniform sensitivity, basically for flat F new spectrum objects, and even better for even redder objects, because we have this catharsis of certain strategy that totally boosts the sensitivity in the blue. Uh, it's driven by a state-of-the-art dedicated survey, as uh, Patricia will show uh, right after me, and it relies on the expertise of a team that has already developed instrument, astronomical instrumentation, uh, like, for example, Negara, Carmen, and also the contribution of our, uh, in a way, uh, colleagues at the WIF Spectrograph. Uh, one of the issues that, of course, we have to address in this next phase, hopefully, that we will uh, be able to enjoy, is the characterization of the UV side, the, the near UV side of, this, of the observatory, which uh, I think requires an extra time. This is coordinated by Jaime Zamorano, which is already in contact with uh, Santos Pedraz and the direction directorship of the observatory. And I want also to emphasize that for the Junta Andalucía institution, for all the universities, this project will certainly leave a research and development in print and will help them to actually contribute to the development of other instruments uh, in Spain or elsewhere, right? And that's also goes for the TESIC institution, of course. But I think it's a good way also to involve the universities, the public universities in Andalucía and also our university here in, in Madrid. And I just want to finish uh, mentioning that, of course, Tarsis is the tool for catharsis, right? And I just encourage you to uh, be, stay connected for the following talks. And finally, just one sentence to, just to be sure that we are all agree that to be competitive, you must to be ambitious. I mean, there are competitions in other institutes, in other telescopes, and we certainly have to be the ones that put something different at the telescope, something competitive, that we have something brand new, and make the, the instrument and the telescope to be placed scientifically in the place it deserves. And I think that goes also for the AIA. The AIA future, and I think the entire future of the astronomical community is in our ICTS. And we should be sure that we put the best our, at our institutions. Thank you very much.
Thanks so much, Armando. Yes, I have a uh, very ambitious uh, program, and well, I'm impressed because you have already a lot of work already done. Congratulations for that. Okay, we have time for a couple of questions. Caballero, sorry, one from Jose Caballero from the YouTube channel. Is the front end compatible with Carmenes? Good question. Armando? Yeah. Well, in principle, the, the only the part that we have to work more on the next phase is actually the front end optics. We have we have contacted already with light for the basically the slicing or the fibers, depending we have not decided yet that part. But in principle, they they, they say that it's uh, feasible to produce those image slicers. We don't have the quotation yet, though. Uh, and in principle, also, they, they know that they have to respect all the, the envelopes, including the, the one for Carmenes and even the, the one for Carmenes Plus. Any other question? Nothing in the YouTube chat, so probably we can move away to the next talk. Okay, we are just Thank you, Jose and everybody else. We're going just to continue with the next talk. Patricia Sanchez and Catarsis Calalto Tetra Arm Super Ifu Sabe. Please, Patricia, go ahead. Patricia, are you there? Can you hear me? <clears throat> Can I hear you, Patricia? Excellent. Sorry. Please go ahead. Um, okay. Um, well, I'm going to present uh, 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 the survey um, for which we designed Tarsis, the instrument that Armando just presented. Um, he uh, told us what uh, Tarsis means. I'm going to explain you what uh, Catarsis means. Uh, in the classic tragedies, no, the main reason for misfortune uh, was always the ivories, no, that was considered the main obstacle to knowledge. And catharsis was the means by which mortals could avoid falling into the ivories. No? So in the catharsis, the viewer will be, will be able to get a better understanding of the complex relationships existing in the world and therefore of the universe around, which is uh, what we want to do with this survey. So, um, and this, uh, the project scientists of the project and the deputy ones are Monica Relaño from the University of Granada and Jorge Iglesias. So, we are responsible for putting together uh, this science case, well, together with the rest of the team, of course. Um, what is the motivation? Well, we saw this morning no, two, two beautiful projects, the, the way to understand the relation of galaxies with the environment they live. Um, uh, Jorge, uh, Jorge already saw these plots. No? The, there is a, a morphology density relation no, that it was found already in the 80s. Um, and also, it seems that the fraction of star forming galaxies uh, change with the with the cluster center value. So it's lower in the center of the clusters than in the outskirts. Um, but, but we don't know it's uh, what is this for. No, it's uh, it is because uh, the interaction between the galaxies and the intracluster medium, or it is something that is imprinted in the initial conditions. No? So um, to disentangle between these two options, no, we have to study uh, both no, the growing structures and, and the transformations of galaxies in it. Um, Koch here already mentioned this. Those are the, uh, the processes um, that can transform a galaxy. Um, in the outskirts of the, of the cluster, we can have merges between galaxies. 
if uh, we go into the inside the cluster, the velocities, uh, the relative velocities between galaxies are uh, so high that they don't uh, merge together anymore. But the fast encounters can transform them as well. And then there is the interaction with the intracluster medium, per se, and the thermal evaporation, the starvation, and the ram pressure. Um, well, time scales for all these processes are uh, different, are very different, but also they depend a lot of the condition of the clusters. Uh, there are two clusters that are the same, and the, the effect of these uh, processes depends on the temperature of the cluster, of the density, uh, of the dynamical state, if it's relaxed or is not relaxed. No? So we have to cut all this into account if we really want to understand uh, how the galaxies um, form and evolve inside this large scale structure. So, um, for example, these are um, some people have used the richness for the cluster to to see uh, if a cluster could um, be more influential or less. But um, it, it is so in numerical simulations that the richness is not really related with the dynamical state. So here I'm showing a plot of the richness uh, with the uh, with the red signal for um, those are taken from numerical simulations, and in the in the black points are the relaxed clusters, while the open uh, dots are the unrelaxed clusters. And you can see that that there is not a clear relation between both. You can have two clusters with similar richness are the ones in the bottom, which are very, very different in the dynamical state. So the influence of the intercluster medium on the properties of the galaxies in these two cases is going to be very different. So we have to, uh, it's very important to have into account this dynamical state of the cluster. No? And it's also very important to go beyond the viral uh, the, uh, radius of the cluster because in filaments they, st they already start to go a lot of transformations. No? As, uh, well, we heard this morning already. Uh, Sorry, <laughs> I think I had the virus, so <laughs> a little bit sick today. Um, so here, in the when the when the first, when the galaxies first no, encounter the cluster, um, there is um, a lot of things that encounter. I mean, there is a break of equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium, and also there are shocks. And we expect that here when they already have a, may have like a strong transformations. No? Um, very little words have explored what's happening here, no? in, 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 the, in the way, in the place where uh, the filaments meet clusters. Uh, another problem of, uh, of SARS studying the, the, the effect of environments in galaxies is first, that they use, as in the, in the two plots that I saw at the beginning of the, of the talk, um, the, you, a lot of people use the, the density of galaxies around a galaxy to measure the environment. Um, so for example, we have a here a cluster with the filaments, and I will, uh, they, there is a group of galaxies uh, falling for the first time into the cluster. Um, and it seems very dense, no? A galaxy has a lot of galaxies around, but um, it just falls into the cluster, no? It hasn't experienced the cluster for a long time. Um, also, I can see a group of uh, galaxies in the outskirts of the, uh, in, in the clusters or in the center, but really be in, in projection, no? That is falling along a, a, a filament or, or has nothing to do with the cluster, no? And also, um, sorry, it's not working. Uh, the majority of, uh, of, um, of surveys that have, uh, have into account the spectroscopy aggressive, no? That you can a little bit distinguish between these things, have done it with uh, multifiber spectrograph. Um, there is um, at least a couple of problems with this. First is the fiber collection that, for example, in Sloan, you cannot, um, point to two galaxies that are uh, farther away than 0.55 arc seconds. And that produced um, bias against the more dense parts of the clusters. Uh, well, a second problem is also that you pre-select the galaxies. No, You don't want to, to waste your spectroscopic panel, your fiber in something that you are not sure is, is, is an energy from the cluster. So most people um, bias their selection towards red galaxies. And, and well, here is the fiber collision of, uh, of Sloan, and the, the denser uh, regions correspond to denser regions of the space as well. And also, mm, uh, the third problem is the aperture effects. And we know that uh, some of the effects in clusters happen from outside in. And if you put a fiber in the center, we sometimes are missing what is going on, uh, the transformation that are already been going on in the outside. So, um, what is the goal of stars? I'm going to uh, summarize uh, the, all the multiple science cases that we have in one goal, which is to understand the formation of galaxies in relation with the growing of galaxies' scale structure. 
Um, for that, we will study the properties of galaxies uh, in clusters that have different dynamical states. Um, we will observe them beyond the visual radius and into the well into the filament. Um, we also uh, will study the properties of um, well, that, that will give us a, a, the properties in different intracluster medium uh, conditions, of course. And we will also study the uh, growing of the structures themselves. And I'm going to explain how. So to do that, we, we design a survey which consists in, um, in 20 um, science spectroscopy survey or 20 clusters at resist point 15. Why resist point 15? Because with the characteristics of the survey, we will cover a, a wavelength that go into the uh, near ultraviolet part of the spectrum. And I will explain why uh, this is important for us. It's, uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's not taken as a special epoch, but just because it, at this rate, it covers the wavelength rate that we are interested in. So we preselected a sample of uh, 831 clusters, but um, there is a, a, a lot of clusters to choose from. Um, and filaments and, and doing a full care of a small region of the sky because it actually covers the whole sky, so we don't have problem in observing during the whole year. Um, and as, as Armando has said already, we uh, we will cover yeah, not only the that that will uh, this circle here will map the visual radius of this special cluster, but we will cover uh, much further than this. And well, um, all the all the clusters have fancy data. Uh, at least uh, the white bands uh, and the 25 from 24 uh, microns. All, all of them have a uh, slow photometry. Uh, some of them has a uh, standard to do it, uh, estimations, a gray radio observations. I mean, there is uh, a lot of unfamiliar data on the fields. So what we will get? Uh, we will get uh, um, an spectra covering uh, the wavelength range from 278 to approx. To 60, uh, uh, 660 nanometers, um, and we will be able to measure the uh, stellar characteristics as the one uh, here, and we will measure also the the, the nebular lines. Yeah? So the first thing that we are going to do with the uh, is to measure velocities um, for our galaxies, and and do a dynamical analysis of the cluster. So when um, the galaxies fall into the filament to the cluster. Um, so you measure the line of sight velocity compared with the velocity dispersion of the cluster, you see that uh, uh, when you plot it uh, as a function of radius, they in, they fall like uh, following a pattern, you know? a pattern that has this shape of a trumpet. You know? and, and when it, it, it gets into the cluster, it reaches a massive velocity, it gets accelerated until finally it gets in the it gets realized, you no, know, in the in purple uh, ring. Um, well, studying the, the deviations from, from this um, caustic, no, can give us a lot of information about substructure and also about the epoch uh, where the galaxies were accreted, etc. No? So to give you an example, I'm plotting here the predictions of, from a numerical simulation again. Um, this is the, the plot that I was showing you. No? It, it, of course, if the accretion is not isotropic, the caustic is not perfect, the trumpet is not perfect. So the deviations that are outside is because the, the accretion is not isotropic. Um, you can see that the position of the galaxies here depends on the resistance at which the galaxy was accreted in the cluster. So several people have said that you can use this to, uh, to calculate the mass accretion rate to the cluster. It will be invaluable to, um, to understand the transformations at the same time that we understand the rate at which these galaxies are being accreted. No? It's fundamental to, to get the global picture. No? Um, on the other hand, this is a, again another study showing how from the uh, projection of the velocities uh, in the sky, we can derive such a structure using this type of analysis. So in, in the right is the, will be the, um, the 3 d surface structure that this cluster have, and on the left uh, will be how, how will we see it in the sky. No? And as you can see, uh, the method is able to identify all the different structures, some of them are falling to the cluster, uh, and some of them are not related with the cluster. So uh, with this analysis, we will be able to get uh, mass profiles of the clusters. Um, mass profiles of the cluster uh, constitute also a, a, a test of the lambda CDM cosmology because it's predicted that uh, clusters that assemble later are less concentrated as well. So we will be able to measure this, and not only in the video region, but also beyond the video regions. And which is more important, uh, um, if you use X rays or, or um, 
Uh, you need to assume that the cluster is very alive, but we don't have to assume with this analysis any, uh, any dynamical state of the cluster. It works even if the, if the cluster is, is not very alive. So, well, uh, why this hasn't been done before? More, oh, I mean, it, has, it has been done before. I mean, there are several examples, but no more often. No? It's so powerful analysis because you really need to have a, a, a lot of recipes. I mean, you need to have a complete sample in Recif, uh, which is uh, go a magnitude beyond uh, L star in the luminosity function. And this, for example, uh, doesn't happen in as long. So that's why mm, we, uh, we need a like, deeper firing. So what else we're going to do? So um, this, is the main advent, this is the main reason no, uh, for which we uh, wanted to go into the near ultraviolet, and is to do a uh, stellar population analysis, but very detailed. So here I'm showing um, some spectrum. Uh, the red one, I don't know if you can see it very well because the line is very fine. Uh, the, the red uh, one corresponds to a population of, uh, of an old population of nine giga years. And uh, it represents the 99.91% of the total mass. Then the blue uh, is a young population with 65 mega years. And uh, the contribution in mass is 0.09%, very, very little. Okay? So the, uh, the black one is the sum of the, the, of the two populations. So if you go to the bottom panel where you see the residuals, you can see that in the optical, both is, mm, the, the old, it, it, sorry, in, in, in the bottom, I'm comparing the old, only the old, with, the, with this composed spectra, which contains the old and the young. So you can see that in the optical, these two populations are, mm, you cannot distinguish them. But as, you, uh, as soon as you go to the near ultraviolet, you start to see the difference. No? So recently, um, well, here is just too many because I, I didn't know if you could see it in the, in the slide before. So um, uh, recently, um, Constantine has uh, done a, um, a test uh, using line strain indices. In this case, uh, the analysis is using line strain indices in the optical and uh, also in the ultraviolet. Um, so he's done a test by generating uh, synthetic star formation histories uh, in which a tau model, uh, you could add them uh, several bars, so no bars, so uh, randomly from zero to six, and randomly the epoch of the star type was different, etc. and the width the, of, the, of the tau um, uh, function as well. So uh, he did like a 2,500 model. And he had also a, allowed for chemical evolution and for dust as well, for two component dust, different for the young and the old component. So he did the analysis with the indices, and those are the uh, mean luminosity weighted ages that he recovers. So the, the green is the true value of the ages. The red, are, uh, what he gets uh, if, uh, if he doesn't have the, the near ultraviolet uh, indices, and the, the blue is what he gets when, when the near ultraviolet ones are included. No? As you can see, I mean, the improvement is... Uh, it's very good. I mean, there is no bias in the mean age of uh, the distribution, and also uh, the, the standard deviation is much smaller. And what you can see, you can see here in the plot in the left is for a spectra with a signal to noise of 10, and the right uh, for a spectra with a signal to noise of 10. But those are the mean ages, which are more accurate. But what is what we really want is uh, to be more subtle, no? And so for that, we will, uh, uh, we will perform uh, a full spectral feeding. And those are some examples of the of, of the output that we can get, no? Which are yeah, discriminate between yeah, difference which are um, sad and that's for having the near ultraviolet. Furthermore, uh, Jorge already mentioned that this morning that it seems that when you analyze the uh, star forming galaxies in a cluster, uh, you get that galaxies in the center of the cluster or in the dense in the denser regions are more metal rich. In, in the gas, in the warm gas. And the way this has been interpreted is like mm, to fall. No, it can be because those, those galaxies cannot accrete pristine gas anymore. So they are more metal rich than galaxies that can. And uh, the other possibilities is that these galaxies have, uh, have, have a more efficient star formation. So has the star formation history, which is more condescended in the past. No? That's the, again the nature versus natural dilemma. No? And one way to disentangle the two is to study both the stellar and the uh, nebular luminosity. 
So here is an example of uh, an award that we did in 2004. Um, uh, what is stood here is the, the abundance of CN uh, with respect to iron, and then the magnesium uh, uh, with respect to iron, and on the bottom, the magnesium with respect to CN. Um, uh, what Conrado was finding was that there was a relation between the CN abundance and the luminosity in X rate of the cluster, no? uh, the mass of the cluster somehow. Um, well, here we couldn't disentangle between the carbon and nitrogen. So it was difficult to quantify or interpret this. Uh, it's also difficult um, um, to know which stars are producing carbon and nitrogen. It could be that it's like intermediate mass stars, although it could be a contribution of also from, from massive stars to nitrogen, for example. No? But, um, but now with the near ultraviolet, uh, we have uh, indices that are very sensitive to nitrogen, for example, 36A. And also that are more sensitive to magnesium than the classical uh, leak indices no? in, in, in the blue. So we will be able to separate the carbon and nitrogen abundances um, and get a better uh, estimation of magnesium. No? And we can use that as well, uh, together with chemical evolution models, to further constrain the star formation history you know? and try to get a consistent, a consistent picture. Um, we can also do that with the, with the nebular abundances, of course. We, we want to get yeah, the, complete, uh, the complete picture. No? So, for example, um, in, here in the plot of, um, on the right, I'm um, showing the prediction by Moyan. I didn't put the reference. Um, so, in the nitrogen over, over oxygen abundance, as a function of the oxygen abundances, for uh, different, um, these different delays times to, to release the carbon and the nitrogen to the interstellar medium, and on the bottom uh, with different star formation history, so star formation efficiencies. Um, you can see that uh, you can also use this radio to discriminate between different star formation histories and also the genes, but together with the stars and with the star formation history that we derive from, from this full spectral feeding, we will be able to constrain all of them. So our uh, wavelength range cover um, well, a lot of us to measure the nitrogen too, as well as what well, those are the more typical uh, lines. No? We'll be able to measure also oxygen abundances in the case in which we, we observe for 383 with the direct methods, otherwise, um, when a strong line methods. Sorry. <laughs> Furthermore, in the ultraviolet, you have, you have the doublet, the resonance light magnesium too. Um, this, uh, this line can be sometimes in absorption, um, in, in normally in outflows that are clearly absorbed by the interstellar medium, but also sometimes in low metallicity galaxies, you can see it in emission, uh, coming directly from the H2 region, no? from the nebular component. And also, um, recent analysis by Buseva uh, in, in 2013 and 2019, it has shown that um, the that this is very correlated with the age of, um, with the mass of the, the, the correlation between the old, the mass of the old stars and the young stars, and also the age of the, of the last stars. So again, we can use the magnesium abundance to constrain, further constrain the star formation history. Furthermore, um, we can also measure the, the nebular abundance of magnesium, which is, has been done in very, very few studies, no? when, outside the Milky, outside the Milky Way and the local group, in, in the galactic H2 regions. And magnesium is a uh, refractory element, so we can uh, try to uh, measure the, the dust depletion. No? Um, because we have uh, wise as well, um, and we have another way to constrain the extinction that I saw you now, but uh, we, we will be able to, to actually yeah, be accurate on that. No? And compare, yeah, and also uh, we will be able to compare uh, nitrogen and magnesium, which is the same element in the stars and in the ice, which is something that has not been done before. And that's very important to put into agreement the both scales of metallicity and also for chemical evolution models. So that's a um, very important point. In my opinion. So one advantage that we have is that uh, our analysis of the stellar population doesn't use the continuum. So um, once we uh, have our star formation history, we can uh, know the intrinsic uh, flux uh, that is given by our models. And then uh, by dividing by your survey, obtain uh, an extinction curve. So this, together uh, with the wise photometry, will allow us to make extinction corrections without having to assume a given shape for the uh, for the extinction curve. Um, and of course, that's very important for our uh, uh, nebular analysis. Um, well, 
Uh, I'm a security lens. I haven't talked about uh, fireman's uh, at all yet. Um, but one of the things that uh, we will be able to explore is how the alignment of the spin. The, I, sorry, escape. I missed one. One, one is like explaining. So, well, one, how the, the the spin of the galaxies uh, is aligned with the filament. So um, the predictions are that uh, in uh, spherical systems like uh, elliptical galaxies, the spin is aligned with the cluster with the filament, while in in, in these galaxies is perpendicular to the to the filament. And that's um. Sorry. That's been related with the with the with the way the um, with the with the tidal fields, no? That, that are responsible for in these galaxies to produce the angular momentum, and also in general to produce the, the collapse of the dark matter halos, no? So uh, the alignment is not it's, it's actually um, what you expect is very correlated with the with the density uh, with the tidal fields that you have, no? And that that. Somehow determine the, how the, the structures form, how the structures collapse. So it's important to study the alignment. So a, a, a lot of the studies have tried to do this using imaging. So you assume that the rotation is along the minor axis, and using your images, you can you can study the, the, the alignation of the spin. The problem is that with images, you don't, you don't even know if the upper side is, uh, is closer to you or farther away, no? as I'm showing here in this slide. And we can solve this because we have a course like velocity field, no? we, can, we don't have a lot of resolution, but we can disentangle. And also we can see as well, at least, uh, the, how the spiral lines are. So assuming that uh, the spirals are trailing, which are in the majority of galaxies, we can uh, separate, we can know, know which side of the galaxy is closer to us and, uh, and, and practice the generation, if you will. <coughs> so, what are we offering? There are a lot of studies on, on the relation between environment and galaxies. Um, what, are, what do we want? Another one, what, what are we going to do new that has, hasn't been done before? No? Well, first is that we have uh, um, enough uh, residual galaxies to do a dynamical analysis of the environment and being able to study the substructure and, and, and therefore, and the, the better understand the interactions uh, that the galaxies are having with the interclassial medium. Um, we will be able as well to do this together with analysis of uh, how the, uh, the the structures are growing, what is the mass pressure rate, and, and what is the alignment of the filaments, no? that tell me a lot about how this is built. And also we will be able to get like mass profiles of the clusters, which is gonna is giving us a lot of information already about the epoch of first collapse. No? Then we are not selecting the targets, so we will not be biased towards uh, um, red galaxies. Um, and our cell evolution analysis will be uh, much, 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 much more detailed due to the inclusion of the near ultraviolet uh, wavelength range. So, oh, and also because we have a nebular analysis and uh, with stellar analysis, uh, we will be able to uh, get complementary way to get the star formation history, which we hope will give us a much more detailed uh, um, picture of what is going on with the galaxy. No? Uh, but that's not all. Um, does it have a lot of layers? Because um, we are getting a spectroscopy of a uh, field, blind spectroscopy of everything that is in there. And um, uh, because it's uh, starting in such a blue uh, wavelength range, we will be able to observe uh, Lyman alpha already from uh, RESID 1.6. And with this uh, uh, flux limit that already Armando said. Um, uh, it's true that it's a 3.5 instrument, but the fact that we, we are able to observe the Lyman alpha so, so close, it giving us a lot of advantages because uh, the cosmic dimming is much less and and also because we are going to be observing in the peak of the almost on the on the star formation density no, of the universe. So um, um, Jose is going to talk about this now. So I'm going to leave it in here. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Patricia. I don't know if we have a very fast question. No, no we don't? OK. So then we move uh, to the next uh, speaker.
Uh, Jose Oñorbe from the University of Seville is going to talk about catharsis, high set observations, and synergies. Hello, can you hear me? You know, I go. Hello, Jose? Yes, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I'm going to share my presentation. Uh, okay. Everything is working. You see the presentation and you hear me well? Yes, you may proceed. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I'm really happy uh, to be talking here on behalf of the Catharsis team about some of the interesting high risk possibilities that I see that the um, Catharsis service can offer to the astrophysical community. And I'm going to basically show like the, the try to show you like the broad picture of, of what type of possibilities um, we can think and then discuss like a few specific examples in a little bit more detail and of course I'll be happy to to talk about more uh, things in more detail when, when there is time for questions so I don't think that I have to uh, to go over the, um, the catharsis um, survey properties again, but basically we are going to uh, to have a blue and, and a red spectrum. Of course, uh, we are going to be much deeper on the on the blue part. Uh, the catharsis is going to consist of 20 fields for with uh, eight hours in the uh, with a total integration that. Uh, uh, will be of around like eight hours in the blue and 2.45 hours in red. And of course, uh, you probably immediately thought about it, but this brings uh, a lot of interesting, unique high redshift opportunities at the redshifts between one and three. And in particular, I'm going to focus on uh, or the, the one that is probably the the most straightforward is uh, Lyman alpha emitters and the possibility of studying these young galaxies and the luminosity faint end, uh, especially in a range in a redshift range where uh, we don't there is no observations available or not like uh, a lot. And then we have the uh, perhaps an even more interesting part uh, for me, which is the study of the intergalactic and the galactic medium in emission. And this uh, can be, you can think of Lyman alpha blobs, uh, static cold accretion and diffuse warmth of gas, and try to search for counterparts of damp Lyman alpha B systems. So before we get into um, uh, more specific details, here are some results from simulations done by uh, Berton and Shae. Uh, these uh, are projections of a uh, four commoving megaparsec over H, uh, which translate into the sizes that you can see uh, on the left at each of the redshift. The top panel is redshift two, the middle panel is redshift three, and the uh, bottom panel is redshift four. Uh, the field of view at uh, this re uh, basically at redshift two of uh, catharsis is around 1.5 uh, uh, megaparsecs, uh, which is basically very similar at uh, redshift 1.7, which is uh, the limit at which we, we, we would like to study the, the line on alpha. On these maps, you can see the um, uh, surface brightness that the uh, 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 Vertone calculated uh, from uh, their simulations for different lines, basically H1, you can see H1, helium-2, carbon-3, and carbon-4. And uh, just so that you have an idea, what you can see here is the formation of a group. So 
uh, this will uh, be a system that at redshift uh, zero will have around 10 to the 13 solar masses. And you're already with just one uh, field of view, you're already like almost covering uh, at, uh, entirely. Okay, so um, we also have uh, predictions for all the lines. Uh, and of course, the, the thing that we have been uh, calculating the collaboration is how many of our, uh, to think that we are going to be able uh, to measure, taking into account the, the, the properties of the catharsis survey and the tarsis instrument. And uh, this is uh, what I'm showing you here is specifically uh, the results uh, for the uh, surface brightness uh, number counts at redshift two for different lines. You can see uh, hydrogen, helium two, carbon three, carbon four uh, on the left panel and um, the nitrogen, oxygen, neon, and well, a few ion specific ions of these elements. Uh, and basically what we found is that at redshift 1.7, we are definitely expected to see Lyman alpha, uh, carbon three, carbon four, uh, uh, silicon three, silicon four, and oxygen six. Uh, probably uh, we are not going to be, uh, or it is going to be difficult uh, to, to find helium two or uh, nitrogen or uh, five or neon. Uh, of course, the first thing um, to point uh, here is that mm, the modeling of the CGM and the IGM, basically these low densities uh, in galaxy formation simulations is one of the um, uh, most difficult tasks right now for, for this stuff, just because of the uh, type of resolution that is required. So there is some uh, ample room or some relative room in what are the expectations for, for this PDF for the um, uh, observations. But on the other side, I think that is really, really important that we have observations that help us constrain these properties. So just so that you have a, a better idea of how we expect to, to uh, these lines to work with redshift, uh, here I'm showing uh, the same PDFs for the same lines, but now for four different redshifts, basically from redshift two to redshift five. So of course, uh, we expect that the, uh, the lower redshifts, we are going to find way more um, um, uh, emissions and, uh, and we are going to have way more detection. So in this uh, context, uh, let me focus first on the Lyman alpha meters, which of course is one of the uh, main goals and um, immediately scientific, uh, let's say, uh, science products of the uh, catharsis survey or indirect science products from the catharsis survey at high redshift. Um, what uh, the, cat the catharsis service is going to offer us is basically to study the Lyman alpha meters uh, between redshift 1.6 and, and 3. And I think it's especially relevant that we can go to such lower redshifts, basically matching the, uh, the star formation uh, peak, uh, the observational star formation peak. So in this plot, what I'm showing is the star formation rate density versus redshift. As you can see, the, the gray symbols are the star formation uh, rate densities derived from Lyman break galaxies. And the color uh, bars are the ones uh, obtained from Lyman alpha meters. So it's really interesting to, uh, so by studying the Lyman alpha meters at all these ratios, we are not going all, all only to start to have um, information about the luminosity function, fin n, of, of course the star formation rate density, but also a lot of information about uh, the intersection between Lyman alpha meters and uh, Lyman break galaxies. And of course, by studying the alignment alpha beaters, uh, we can connect these studies. We can uh, derive the escape fractions for these galaxies. And the, this is really, really important to try to understand um, if galaxies are responsible of ionization at high redshift. We expect there is like several 
assumptions of how this escape fraction uh, evolved with redshift. And uh, it usually it's assumed like a very, very strong uh, redshift evolution that we could basically try to confirm from the lower, basically the 1.6 uh, uh, redshift data that we can collect. And in this context, there is also a very interesting opportunity because we also have the, the red branch. Uh, very recently, uh, Henry and collaborators have, uh, have studied escape fractions for a, a sample of Greenpeace galaxies. And they have found that the magnetic, uh, the basically the doublet of magnesium two uh, it correlates very, very strongly uh, with the with the sky fraction of Lyman alpha. And they have suggested that this could be like a, a tool uh, to try to obtain like scape fractions at higher redshift where basically Lyman alpha is very difficult to obtain. Uh, so because we have this red uh, branch in Tarsis, we can actually uh, have like a sweet spot in which we could actually measure uh, uh, the, this magnet to doublet at redshift around 1.6 and try to understand and basically use it as a powerful tool to understand basically what is going on in the ISM and the CGM in these galaxies at this redshift. Uh, and by uh, deriving, basically, we have the intrinsic magnetic two flux, we can derive the escape fraction uh, for magnetic two, for magnesium two. And if we have the star formation rate, we could actually derive uh, escape, fra uh, escape fractions from Lyman alpha. And the idea is that we could actually uh, try to reproduce these uh, uh, studies done at much, much lower redshift. So Henry and collaborators did it at uh, 0 0.2. Um, uh, another very interesting um, uh, possibility uh, uh, is the a study of uh, Lyman alpha blobs. Uh, Lyman alpha blobs are basically a stand Lyman alpha emission that were discovered in the uh, 2000, just because at that point is when we reached the technical capabilities to to, to found this uh, really, really large uh, extended Lyman alpha emission. And as you can see in the in the plot, or in the left plot uh, in the uh, presentation, what I'm showing is the expected abundance of Lyman alpha blobs compared with uh, uh, Lyman alpha beaters. As you can see, they are basically tracing uh, high, uh, they basically have, are tracing also like high density regions, but you, you, don't necessarily find, you don't necessarily find Lyman alpha blobs at very, very, very high density. You can find them at all, all densities and actually their physical origin is not clear. Um, it could be like coal, uh, coal uh, gas cooling, or it could be basically some, in some cases, uh, indications are that there is some source that is actually shining the gas, so some AGN or some like very, very active star formation. So by studying uh, the Lyman alpha blots, especially addresses below 2.3, which is a aggressive range in which there has been no study at all, we could try to uh, understand better the origin of um, these objects. And also, even if we, uh, regardless of the statistics that we achieve, uh, there are basically uh, studies done at much higher, basically at higher redshift, are um, arguing that there is no consensus of what is the profile uh, of these Lyman alpha blobs. And if the actual, uh, and if the profile is actually evolving with redshift or not. Uh, so by having like more data at lower redshift, we could definitely uh, try to constrain uh, much better these super interesting um, uh, astrophysical objects. Okay, and I think that with that, I'm going to uh, finish the talk and uh, just basically highlight the idea that with uh, the catharsis survey, we can uh, have a really, really uh, complementary study of Lyman alpha meters and the IGM and CGM in emission at redshifts one between redshift 1.6 and redshift 3. Uh, I have not talked about absorption, but of course there are like uh, catharsis will also offer the possibility of a study uh, absorption features from 
background sources, depending on basically how many of those and what type of, of these background sources we found from, from each field. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited that, uh, about the project and I'll be happy to answer any question if anybody's interested. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Jose. We have a question from Geneva. Uh, you can use magnesium too as indicator of Lyman continuing scale. Would you do that too? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. You can yeah. use magnesium yeah. too as an indicator of <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, no, yeah, yeah, no. Okay. You can use magnesium too as an indicator for Lyman continuing escape. Would you do that too? Yeah, yeah. Okay. There is uh, another question. Maybe this is uh, for the uh, previous uh, talk. The question is maybe for Patricia, but maybe Jose, you may also answer. What are the average spatial scales catharsis will prove? Physical uh, or? Yeah, what recipe? Spatial, uh, spatial scale. I mean, it's, it's, it's like two seconds, which depends on the recipe. Uh, at recipe of the, of the cluster, it will be like uh, four, four, five kilopulses, more or less. And um, well, a, a, a higher recipe, but it will be much, much, much higher. Okay, so thanks so much uh, to the speakers. Um, okay, so let's move on. The speaker is uh, Mr. Carrasco. Uh, Esperanza, uh, sorry. Uh, next speaker is uh, Esperanza Carrasco. Uh, she's going to talk about InnoA facilities to manufacture the optics of Tarsis spectra apps. Esperanza, you can go. Hola. Yes. Hola, hola. Yes, hello, Esperanza. Yes, hello, Okay, muchas gracias. Okay, I'm going to talk about our facilities. Go ahead. Esperanza, do you have also the uh, YouTube channel open simultaneously to the Zoom session? In such a case, uh, please uh, turn off the YouTube. the YouTube channel during your talk. I don't know why this not appear. Okay, no. Okay, uh, just a few words about Inaoe. Now is a research institute in astrophysics, optics, electronics, and computing science. Uh, the main facilities of Inaoe are the uh, Guinea Telescope Millimetrico Alfonso Serrano, the High Altitude Water Sharing Cobb Observatory, and Grand Telescopio Canarias. And in all of these facilities, Inaoe has a collaborative vocation. In the case of the Grand Telescopio Millimetrico, uh, the consortium is formed by INAOE in Mexico and the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. In the case of observat in the Hawk Observatory, the leading institution in Mexico is INAOE, and in the US are the University of Maryland and Los Alamos National Laboratory. In GTC, INAOE shares with UNAM 5% of the observing time. The Institute has been involved in different instrumentation projects, and in particular, 
uh, Megara. Megara was the first instrument in which Inaoi played a major role. And it was a case of success because Megara um, was finished on time, within budget, and fulfilling all the requirements. Inaoi is part of the Megara Consortium formed by uh, the Universidad Complutense de Madrid, Instituto de Subfísica de Andalucía, and the Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. Our responsibility in Megara was the manufacturing of all the optical elements of the Megara spectrograph. And it consists on five collimator lenses, seven camera lenses, 36 windows for the VPH, 24 prisms, and one field lens. And these also include 34 anti-reflection coatings and the cementing of four doubles. In total, there were 73 elements that we manufactured in 2.3 years, including also the collimator and camera optomechanics and the integration and verification. And now it's also part of the WIP collaboration for the William Herschel Telescope. And this consortium is formed by 14 European institutions and in our our responsibility in WIF was the manufacturing of the two cameras, the blue and the red camera, and the collimator mirror of 660 millimeters. And we also uh, produced 20 different reflection coating and one reflecting coating. We manufactured all of these in two years within the schedule of the project. You know, we also participate in uh, the red arm of RODOSPEC for the a Liverpool Robotic Telescope, and we manufactured there also the collimator and the camera lenses. We designed the collimator and camera optomechanics, and also the integration and verification process. And we do all this work in just one year, and the, and the instrument has been working in the telescope since 2007. And now it has also been involved in other projects for Elmer, for GTC, for the Anglo Australian Observatory and other institutions, uh, not institutions. So the kind of uh, optics we can manufacture has demanding specifications in irregularity between 0.5 and 2 fringes with uh, radius of curvature quite precise and also with anti-reflection coatings very, um, very low reflectivity. And we can do that in large diameters uh, up to 320 millimeter in the case of lenses. So this qualifies a high precision optics. So the facilities we have for optical manufacturing are the following. We have uh, an optic workshop with different kinds of machines. And to do high precision polishing, we have 12 access access and you can see here one of the close up of one of the axes without without a polishing um, tooling tool sorry and then to have several axes means that we can polish uh, different surface simultaneously so what happened is that we receive a blank very high um, quality and then we polish the first surface. And you can see here the polishing tool. And when we finish that surface, we uh, protect the surface and polish the second surface of that of each lens. And then when it is uh, finished, we carry out some tests in the machines before we remove the lens from the machine. And you can see there the uh, Newton rings. And to certify the quality of, of our optics, we carry out a certification in an optical in, a, in our in our optical testing laboratory where we have a high precision uh, metrology equipment interferometers a laminar fluid table and we certify our um, optics in a temperature control environment so to test optic, uh, concave surface we um, combine a transmission sphere with an interferometer and 
it produces um, a beam that illuminates the surface under test. We capture the interferogram and then we analyze the interferogram to determine the irregularity and we have the software to do this kind of analysis. This is how it looks in the lab. On the left side, you have the, uh, the interferometer and on the right side, you have the surface on the test. Okay, for flat surface, we use we use a flat reference uh, and with the interferometer we produce a collimated beam that illuminates. Hello? Still there? Using these setups. So. For convex surface. We lost you in the last uh, 20 seconds. Did you hear flat surface? <laughs> If you, if you maybe continue in the, in the previous uh, slide, we'll be okay. Okay, I will carry on from here. In the case of convex surface, we need to have a test plate that has to be manufactured in advance. And that test plate is just a concave surface with the same radius of curvature of the convex surface on their test, on their test. And that means that we need a test plate for each convex surface that has to be more precise than the surface we need to, to manufacture, the lens we need to manufacture. So we have a set of test, uh, test plates already in house. And for large aperture, either, either, yes, either a flat or a convex surface, we use the subaperture subaperture stitching technique that consists in capture different uh, interferograms in subapertures and then from there, from the nine interferograms, reproduce the equivalent interferogram of the whole surface. We have been done for large surface in several projects. We also can have specifications different in the center of a a given aperture, a more demanding uh, specification, and a different one in a, in a larger aperture. So for cosmetic, um, cosmetic characteriz characterization, scratch and dig, we have uh, the laminar flute table where we clean very carefully the, the lens, the surface on the test, And then we have to count all the small scratches and the length of all of them in a given area and see if it pass or not pass according to the norm. So this is a very detailed procedure that has to be very careful. At these laboratory tests, uh, uh, we analyze the surface when it's, when it's finished to, to try to look for any feature it might have. Here are some examples of the optics we have manufactured. The one in the picture now is for Weave, and the next slide is optics for Megara. You have lenses of the camera, the collimator, and in the bottom part, you have um, windows for the VPH of Megara. Here you can see one of Weave uh, lenses, and in the bottom part, there is a witness sample, and these witness samples are very important because for all the surface that need a quote, coating, we need to manufacture one with a sample with the same quality as the optics. And it has to be the same quality in both surface, so it's like manufacturing another uh, lens. Regarding anti-reflected coatings, in our has been working in partnership with another Cognacid Center, which is a Center of Investigaciones en Optica, and we have produced the coatings for the products, in particular for Prospect, for Megara, and for Weave. They have a very good equipment that was acquired really for Megara, to do Megara um, reflection coatings. And they also have an spectrophotometer where the witness sample transmission is measured to characterize uh, the coating. Here are some results of uh, we, what we obtain in Megara optics. Each curve that you will see uh, is the transmission of the surface coated of Megara main optics the requirement is the red line and the real um, transmission of the things are all the rest of the course. From this data, 
we could estimate the Megara uh, may not its total throughput. which is the, <coughs> the specification is in orange and the total transmission is in blue. And Megara has such a good throughput partly because the reflection coatings were designed for each surface at different angle of incidence, which is not a standard way. So for each lens, we report, um, we report 20 parameters, including the coating. This is the field lens of Megara. At Inaue, we also uh, have cemented the doublets of uh, Protospec and, and, and Megara. Okay. We have also done the, to do that, we have the cleaning procedures. This is the transmission spread. We have developed cleaning procedures that have to, be do, have to be done prior to the cementing of the lenses. And then the cementing itself. It is an irreversible process, it has to be very carefully, and it's a high precision process too. So the optomechanics is also of high precision. We have done that kind of mechanics. This is Megara collimator, and also at Inaoi, we carry out the integration and verification of Megara optics. The cleaning is an important part of that. This is high precision optic plus mechanics. And then we do the, the integration of all the whole system at subsystem level, animator and camera. And then test the test, test, test at subsystem level the Megara collimator. And we have as a reference the waveform error expected as built. And we measure the final uh, waveform error and we were within the error budget, both for the collimator, for the camera, and we also had the same experience in the case of Protospec. So just to finish, let me show you some of the uh, with collimator, which is the largest uh, diameter we have manufactured so far. It's a 660 millimeter Gearsoram uh, glass. We receive the blank, we characterize the blank, we polish the substrate, we protect the substrate, and then we uh, coat with an, with an aluminum and the electric coating. Now that's the way the collimator looks at NOVA in the Netherlands. So in summary, In our manufactures high precision optics with demanding specifications, large diameters, different materials, we can also do the cementing. We can develop high precision optomechanics, uh, be in charge of the integration of the optics uh, plus optomechanics and to test at subsystem level. So Inaoi is a member of the Tarsis Consortium. Inaoi has worked with the members of the Tarsis Consortium you know, offers expertise in high precision optics, has a scientific group interested in surveys, in the surveys, Darcy surveys, and you know, is willing to provide in-kind resources to prepare a full proposal for the spectrograph optics manufacturing work package. You know, is in, has, an, has already signed a letter of intent. And you know, it has the facilities and human resources to manufacture the optics of Darcy's spectrographs. Thanks so much, Esperanza. <clears throat> I think that, well, we have already accumulated 10 minutes of delay, so, and no question. So, in any case, uh, thanks so much, and we continue with the next speaker. 
Marisa García Barcas, she's going to talk about the management plan for Tarsis instrument for Caja. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. perfectly well. Hi, a pleasure for me to be here today, remotely. So I'm going to, to finish this, uh, this set of uh, talks on Tarsis with the management plan. Uh, at the beginning of the, of the program of this uh, meeting, I was uh, requested to, uh, to give a brief short of uh, what Fractal can do for uh, professional astrophysics. So uh, it's just a few slides. So Fractal is our company that we founded 15 years ago. The motivation was to keep the know-how accumulated by our team working at different research centers, university, universities, and the GTC project office. And uh, since then, we have been focused our services on professional astrophysics in management, system engineering, instrumentation, and software. This is a list of the services we can provide and that you can uh, check in more detail. Now, I'm going to, to show you just a few slides on the large projects in which we have participated or are participating now. The first of this project is Scorpio for Gemini telescopes. A, a fractal is doing the optics, mechanics, and cryogenics. We work for SWERI in San Antonio, Texas, and with the collaboration in the consortium with the Space Telescope at York Washington University. So you can see here some of the designs that we have done. The project is now in the manufacturing phase, and we will start the integration at University Complutense of Madrid in a few months from now. The second project to show you is a 6.5 meter telescope in uh, the uh, Observatory of San Antonio Mar de San Pedro Martin in Baja California. The partners of this uh, project are uh, UNAM and Inaue from Mexico and Stuber Observatory University of Arizona and Smithsonian Astronomical Observatory from uh, Harvard, Cambridge. So Fractal is, uh, is doing the management, system engineering, and also we have done some consultancy in optics, mechanics, and civil works. The status of this project is that the detailed design phase is finished. The optics is being polished, and now we are waiting for funds to start construction on site, for which permission has been already awarded. The third project is Megara that you know, in which uh, we, uh, we work for UCM and for the IAA. In the, uh, with the following services, the management, system engineering, the design in optics, mechanics, and detector, some control system tools that the um, fiber modes acquisition tools and, and uh, quick look analysis, the detector and data acquisition system, and the participation in the integration and system level and all tasks of integration at commissioning and the observatory. Here you can see some of our happy faces in the commissioning in 2017, and then the operation started uh, in July 2018. And finally, last but not least, Carmenes is uh, uh, the instrument you know very well for Caralto. We uh, collaborated with the uh, management and system engineering, and also with the detector characterization and data acquisition system. This uh, project was a really scheduled driven, it uh, was now or never project, and it was a pleasure for us to work with the Observatory of Alto and all of you, of course, IAA and all the parks. Uh, here, more happy faces in the Carmenes Commissioning, in which you can see some of the speakers today and how happy is the end of the instrument, what is not the case for TASIS now, because we are in the beginning. So we, we are fighting for doing this instrument, and I'm going to present what we have prepared as uh, draft management plan that, of course, we it's our intention to improve in the next months. So I'm going to follow uh, some aspects of the team scope, the tracking tools we use, the calendar, the budget cash flow, uh, the risk control, what is going to be done in the feasibility study to finish with some conclusions. 
Starting with the team is one of our main strengths because the consortium is, uh, uh, has a lot of experience both individually and as a team. Four of the, of the partners have worked together in Megara and uh, we have been working together in different projects. The PI and co-PI, Armando and Jorge, are fully supported and respected by both the consortium and the institution, what is really important for the success of the project. Also, we count with experienced project scientists and co-project scientists that are setting the scientific requirements for catharsis service. And in summary, we have a highly motivated, enthusiastic, and committed team with key persons at all levels. This is the Catharsis Consortium organization chart in which we have a pre-assignation, pre-assignment, sorry, of different work packages to the different partners. We are working more on this in order to accommodate all the tasks. And uh, as you can see, uh, the leadership is uh, being done by UCM and IAA at, at both principal investigator and science. And then uh, the proposal is the, the fractal. We will work in project management system engineering and the design, in AOE in the optics manufacturing, and the IAA also in the cryostat and detector. UCM is the, in the data relation pipeline with a lot of previous experience. And we have a couple of work packages and the discussion in the consortium. So the communication channel, channels we established are the common ones, the email communication, of course, reporting a consortium weekly, weekly telecom, and also a team for night telecom with the project manager, system engineer, and all work package managers with a clear agenda, actions, and review of the milestones and the different uh, ending things of if group. So we are going also to use uh, our specific tools like Manatee, Dogman, and Jeco tools for the project tracking. And uh, the plan is to have at least a couple of face-to-face -face meeting, coronavirus permitted, and depending, of course, of the parties. Okay, uh, for the scope, uh, we have divided the work in nine work packages. In this moment, all the work uh, on uh, surveys are within science package, and the rest are uh, management system engineer, of course, all hardware and software elements of TARSIS. This is a view of the tracking tools that, that are now fully prepared for for TARSIS, so we are already working and we are ready to use them to control management documentation and configuration. For the calendar, it's one of our main uh, topic to work because we think that TARSIS is a schedule driven. We know that the observatory is not in danger anymore. Congratulations and happy for all of us. But we need to carry out the survey on time to have the desired high scientific impact and be competitive. Uh, also, we do not have money to extend team resources forever, and we need to spend the funds as the required reading to spend theater funds, national plan funds, etc. So I'm not, I don't know if with the streaming you can see this, but I'm going to explain the, the Tarsis calendar. So first, uh, we, uh, we plan a extended design stage because things need time, but at the same time, we are going to do things before the end of the design stage in order to be on time. So for the feasibility study, we propose to move fast for finishing the study at the end of September. Then uh, we would start a preliminary design phase in which we propose an optics preliminary design be, uh, mid March next year, in order to be able to order the plans and also order the detectors. Since this moment, we will start the plans procurement and then the detectors procurement at the same time while we go on working on the design on different elements. This is very important because I will, I will show you later, the critical path will go completely through optics. The PDR is planned some months later, September next year, and then we will start as soon as the plants will arrive, or some of the plants will arrive, the spectrograph optics manufacturing, and a few months later, the, optics man, the focal plane optics manufacturing, as Armando has told you, we are also working uh, on that, getting uh, 
reliable quotation and calendar for the potential uh, image slicer because for the fiber options we have all the information we need for this phase. So we will start the optics manufacturing and later on the focal plane optics manufacturing and the, the three blue spectrographs will be working together because they have exactly the same lenses and later on the uh, red spectrograph. So this uh, would be finished in two years and this is possible as Esperanza has shown before, they have done with more lenses in less time. So we are confident that we can do that. Uh, with respect to the cryostat detector and that acquisition system led by IAA, the plan is to have the detector soon and then to establish an engineering prototype and to have the different detectors also soon in order to study things not so related to the detector, but related to, for example, the crosstalk, et cetera, effects of having several detectors. For the software development, we planned several releases with a uh, release for the integration and final release for the, uh, for the delivery. And we have a complete AAV phase with all the elements. The shipping is planned in September 2024, at least with two of the spectrograph and four or uh, the spectrograph three months later with a commissioning in the first trimester of 2025. With this calendar, we have established the critical path that, of course, goes through the feasibility study that has to be early, the blanks ordering, the starting of optics manufacturing, of course, the blanks in-house when needed. And this is because one of the tasks of the feasibility study will be studying the blanks for the blue and the delivery time in more detail before designing everything to avoid surprises. And then, of course, the AEV tasks at the end. I have summarized on the left some dates of this critical path. The critical path, as I will comment later, will be automatically computed with a Manatee tool and will be updated daily. So for controlling the calendar, we define the milestone at the level of the project, and then we assign the milestones to the task. So the schedule tracking in base is based on this low-level milestone control. You have to control the low-level milestone if you have if you want to control the uh, the the calendar as a whole. So as uh, the critical path is calculated not only for the main path but also for all the milestone near the path. The method has been successfully tested in Carmen and San Megar. Yes, with the uh, thank you, Jesus. With the uh, budget. We have done a budget that is available in an Excel table, and we have computed the cash and in-kind contribution for all the nine work packages. We have a total of 5 million euros for the cash needed for the project with a contingency gross 20%. This is a distribution of the work packages, uh, the, the money among the different work packages, being the work packages that needs more money, the optics and detectors. So the numbers are 5 million without contingency, six with contingency. We have also an important contribution of in-kind resources at the level almost of the gas, 4.5 million. And also we have computed the different contribution of the different work packages that of course will be refining in the next months. With the number of, uh, of uh, 8,000 euros per night, we obtain for this in-kind contribution even more night than required for the survey. So also this has to be analyzed in detail with the observatory. I think that the instrument deserves the time is requested by the survey team. We have already uh, accounted for the cash flow per year because we know it is important to have the money in advance and to spend the money to be sure that we spend the uh, European funds. So we have done the cash flow per year, the accumulated uh, cash flow, and you can see all these numbers in the budget table we have delivered. So for budget control, we uh, control the funding sources, the realistic cashing and cash out figures, the uh, purchase orders, and also we define some merit figures applied to the budget items to be sure that the contingency is well calculated. For the risk control, uh, we implement the system engineering procedures 
uh, since the early stage of the feasibility scale, define the high level requirements, operation and maintenance requirements, and flow down to specifications, define interfaces, keep a design robust and simple, and uh, uh, control the risk associated to the calendar and budget with close tracking. Also, the building care, of course, with communication in all directions and the establishment of clear responsibilities reporting lines and agreed project disciplines that is many. <laughs> Uh, for the feasibility study, we will review scientific requirements and prepare specifications, uh, also review comments and recommendations and make a plan to answer external and internal questions throughout the feasibility study, define trade-off analysis to be done. Main issues now are the materials of the spectrograph and image slicer versus fiber for focal plane unit, define the plan with clear goals, define the deliverables according to the contract with Caleralto, prepare a management plan, prepare a funding plan, and deliver the feasibility study by the end of September. As a conclusion, the consortium has been established for developing capsin instrument. Scientific requirements for the instrument and the survey have also been established. A preliminary management plan with work package distribution, calendar budget, and cash flow has been drafted. Software tools are ready to facilitate management and system engineering processes for TARSIS. We propose a calendar of four years, starting with the final approval to ship the instrument with first light in the first sem semester of 2025, we need a budget of 6 million euros, including contingency that it is in the same range that Carmen is, that was 6.4, almost five years ago. So it's not that much. So if this is chosen to proceed with the feasibility study, we are ready to work. And we have got this from Wikipedia and that the optical, optimal performance zone is just outside the comfort zone. So if you want and we want the best performance, we have to leave this comfort zone. So thank you very much. And that's the end of my talk. OK, thanks a lot, Marisa. I think that we have a question. So. Marisa, one question from Marco Azzaro. The question is, uh, isn't it 20% uh, contingency low for a scheduled driving project? Hi, Marco. Well, in fact, not because we have considered a lot of contingency uh, or, or a lot of reliability at, this, at the time of uh, calculating the different elements. Uh, the only element that uh, we really don't know exactly the cost is the image slicer. For the rest, we have the codes from Megara or even more recent quotes. So we really think that we we are fine. We have to work more on that, of course. Okay, so more questions? No, no in the channel. Okay, so thanks a lot, Marisa. Thank you very much. And with this, uh, we have finished our first uh, afternoon sessions. So now we are going to do a virtual coffee break. And we will, we will be back at the same time. At the same time. So 15.5 yeah. is OK. So we have something like a, something like a 15 minutes yeah. now on. OK, thanks so much. And see you in a while.
Anybody there? So, is uh, Claire Pope? Are you there, Claire? So, uh, can you hear me? Hi, Claire, are you there? We are starting the Latino session. Or, Luis, are you there? Can anybody hear me? Hi, everybody. We are starting the Latino session. Uh, hi, Claire. Are you there? Okay, okay, thank you, Marisa. Uh, Claire, are you there? Okay, uh, so, uh, Claire, can you please share your screen? Okay, thank you. We are starting with Claire Pope, uh, the first talk on Latino and IFU for the Calalto 2.2 telescope. So, uh, when you want, Claire. Okay. Uh, so for people who don't know me, uh, my name is Claire Poppert. I am the lead fiber scientist for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Um, I'm here in a room with Alex Kim and Patrick Jelinski, who is the um, spectrograph scientist for DESI. But today we're going to talk about a new instrument proposal called Latino. In this talk, I'm going to start with the instrument specifications and design. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about our expertise here and the facilities we have, um, in addition to the expertise that we have in Granada. I'm going to talk about the deliverables um, that we'll deliver if we win this proposal and then finally some conclusions. So the instrument specification. Uh, the instrument will have a main field of view of uh, more than 10 seconds by 10 seconds. Uh, our spatial sampling um, is half an arc second, uh, which drives the fiber size that you'll see in the next few slides. Our resolution is around 1,000, uh, but probably a little bit more. Our wavelength range will span 360 to 980 nanometers. Um, the spectrograph design that I'll talk about later, um, the off-the-shelf design is a three-arm, but one of our deliverables is whether um, a two-arm design would be um, also an option. And then we also have some flux calibration, uh, which you'll see. So here is a schematic of the instrument on the 2.2 meter telescope. Uh, we're at the um, RC focus. We have a, um, a micro lens fiber bundle. There are 500 fibers on that bundle uh, with a hexagonal array of micro lenses. Uh, we have some guide and acquisition cameras. Those 500 fibers uh, we'll put into one roughly 10 meter fiber cable, um, and that will feed one spectrograph. Uh, we've baselined a DESI spectrograph. This is um, a spectrograph that we have a lot of experience with here. Um, there's a few different instruments proposing to use a spectrograph. It's an off the shelf design. Um, it works really well. We understand it. Uh, so that's why we're using this as our low risk, low cost option. The detectors uh, that would go in, uh, we have some uh, DE cam, dark energy camera spectrographs available. They are 2K by 4K rather than the 4K by 4K design. But uh, one of the proposal parts is that we will look to see if we can put them up or whether having a 2K detector in there is sufficient. 
that is the schematic on the instrument overview. To give you a close up of the focal plane design, this is a 500 element micro lens IFU. I said before, field of view of uh, more than 10 arc seconds by 10 arc seconds with a spatial sampling of half an arc second. Um, these type of fiber bundles are being built by a lot of different groups being deployed on a lot of instruments. Um, they're also another low risk option. The hexagonal micro lenses provide a near uniform field factor um, and having the hexagonal shape rather than circular uh, minimizes the geometric focal ratio degradation induced in the fibers. Uh, so this means that all of the angles going into the fibers are all um, on axis rather than changing the angle that you'd have with a circular micro lens. Uh, the guiding and acquisition, we have uh, three guide cameras and then we have one multi wavelength imager um, that we use for acquisition and atmospheric transmission monitoring. Uh, this is a similar type of camera as was used on SNPs, which we also have a lot of experience with here. Um, I'd like to point out that this cartoon is not to scale. It just kind of gives you an idea of uh, what it is that we're proposing. So the focal plane, um, we can't just have the micro lens fiber bundle. Um, we have to make the rays telecentric uh, entering the fibers. So we also include some four optics. Um, this is uh, an enlarger. This allows us to set the micro lens pitch um, into something that is actually manufacturable. You know, we have very small fibers, there are only 30 microns that allow us to get the spatial sampling that we require. Uh, but having these four optics mean that we can build a micro lens array uh, that will convert the F8 down to about F4 to feed the fibers and also give us a pitch of about one millimeter, which is um, something that's early standard um, to manufacture. And it's similar to what other people do. The fiber cable, this is again something that we have a lot of experience with. Um, I say the cable is planetary wound. Um, this is similar to FMOS, to PFS, to DESI. Um, the diagram kind of in the middle on the bottom shows a cross section through the fiber. So you have a central element, a central tensile element um, to prevent stretching. And then around that element, um, you have 11 tubes. Each tube has 25 fibers. Um, and then these fibers are helically wound. This means that as the telescope moves, you give equal bends um, to the fibers. And then it has a, a protective sheath on the outside. Um, we have a lot of experience with these cables. Uh, for DESI, we did a lot of testing. Um, we did thermal testing. We did fiber walk testing. Um, we did stiffness testing um, to ensure that the telescope can still move once you have this fiber cable on. Um, a negative is that the fiber length must be slightly increased uh, to accommodate the winding, um, but not very much at all, especially for a 10 meter fiber. That's the cable. And then the other end, the spectrographs. Uh, here I show the DESI spectrograph. I don't know, can you see my mouse when I move it? No. Um, so the fiber slit is kind of in the middle at the bottom. So the fibers are kind of coming out of the page 500 of the fibers. Um, those 500 fibers, the first thing they hit is the collimator mirror on the right. That light is um, reflected back. And then if we just follow the red channel, it hits a dichroic. Um, and then um, the red wavelengths are sent towards the red camera. We have a volume phase holograph grading. Uh, we have an oil triplet as part of the camera. Um, we have a field lens on the CCD, which seals the uh, cryostat. And then we have a, a CCD, which is tilted uh, to reduce the ghosting um, on the camera. If we have more questions about the spectrograph, we have a spectrograph expert here. Uh, we'll save that until the end. Um, but you know, this camera, it was designed here. It was built at Winlight. We're using it now. It has excellent performance. Um, my next slide shows some images from DESI in action. Top left are 10 DESI spectrographs housed in the Coday room at Kitt Peak, um, the four meter telescope. Um, Latina would only use one DESI spectrograph, um, but it would still be in a Coday room to keep the uh, temperature stable. 
I show one volume phase holograph grating on the bottom left. This is uh, about a six inch optic. I show the spectral range um, that we have in each of those three cameras. And then on the bottom right, I estimated the throughput. Um, so this is a DESI spectrograph with a 10 meter fiber run. Um, this is the FBP polymicro fiber that has excellent FOD performance. And then I also included the throughput that we get from the DESI corrector, which is um, maybe a bit pessimistic because we'll have fewer optics in Latino. But still, we're averaging around 45% estimated throughput. At LBL, we have a lot of fiber expertise and facilities. Um, I show you on the top left, our fiber cleaving, bonding, and inspection bench. Uh, we made 5,000 fibers um, all at LBL. We have test benches um, used during um, building for Q&A to get a quick check of the performance of a fiber system. And then we have uh, more elaborate fiber benches that we use during R&D to optimize the performance and understand it. On the bottom left, I show you some, uh, we have bake out facilities so that everything's clean before we send it for anti-reflection coating. And on the bottom right, we have a DESI slit, um, 500 fibers on a curved slit um, that feeds the DESI spectrographs. These were built, um, the DESI slits were built in Durham, um, but we designed a lot of the fixturing uh, that was used to build those slit blocks. Uh, Granada also has a lot of expertise and facilities. Um, we list some of the instruments that they've been involved in. Um, they also have a lot of support um, for this instrument. Um, yeah. This proposal, the deliverables, uh, we will deliver a fiber bundle prototype, which will include testing. Uh, this will result in a publication. And also this type of work is really great um, to support students. This could be a, a grad student, um, yeah, this kind of works really good for student work. Uh, we also do a trade study, a trade study for the spectrograph design. Uh, we could look into a reduced cost two-arm spectrograph um, rather than the off-the-shelf DESI spectrograph. In conclusion, Latino is low risk and low cost. Uh, we can leverage IFU development for the instruments. Um, I'm currently working on an instrument proposal for Keck called Phobos. And this is an 1800 fiber bundled uh, microlensed IFU. Um, the baseline DESI spectrograph is purchased off the shelf from WinLife, and the uh, DESI spectrograph is proven, and the experts are at Berkeley. We have CCDs that are available to us, and they work for the instrument design. And we have external funding and consortium contributions, which may offset the integral field unit and spectrograph costs. Does anybody have any questions? Question, uh, did you finish, Claire? Anybody who is not on mute, have any questions? Okay, so questions for Claire? Maybe the questions will be after the science proposal. Okay. So, yeah, yes, so sorry, there, there is one. Here, there is a, a question, Claire. Hi, Claire. This is Jesus. Do you have an estimation about the developing time framework for this instrument? Anybody have heard you? Uh, yeah. Do you have a cost estimate? Uh, yes. I guess we we should say what the answer is, which is uh, we put down uh, two, two million, million euros. Two million euros. Yes, but the time framework. The developing time. Yeah, sorry. I mean about the developing time needed to uh, to get ready this instrument. This in time. Can you hear me? Oh, we can hear you now. Okay. I mean, uh, do you think uh, this instrument could be ready? I think it's actually. Um uh, pretty quick because a spectrograph. Well, what's the lead time on a spectrograph? It'll take okay. a year, year and a half, something like that. Around a year, year and a half for the spectrograph. Uh, the fiber part, I think, would be pretty quick. Uh, we, you know, we've just built a 5,000 fiber instrument. Building a 500 fiber instrument is 
kind of small to us now, which would not have been the case five years ago. Okay, thank you. Another question, do you have experience with 30 micro fiber? And how about operation in the fractional monthly between lens array and the fibers? Yeah, no, I've never worked with fibers that are this small before. Um, this is why part of the proposal deliverable was building a prototype unit um, to help us understand that better and to develop our techniques. And what about aberration and diffraction losses? There's also a question uh, from Martin. Martin, can you can we hear you, Martin? So the, the question the question from Martin is, uh, do you have a, a cost? Oh, go, go ahead, Martin. Switch on the microphone. Thanks very much for the presentation. Um, we have had the experience uh, with PMAS when we actually built a lens array of one millimeter pitch, not hexagonal, but uh, with quadratic lenses. Um, that A, the aberrations of those micro lenses, and B, the diffraction pattern was really creating an image of the micro pupil projected on the fiber core that was significantly larger than just using geometrical optics. So, for example, for a 100 micron uh, fiber, uh, we had a nominal uh, micro pupil diameter of 45 microns, and still in that configuration. 30% throughput losses due to aberrations and diffraction. So I imagine this could be quite serious if you were going even smaller. Well, thank you for that comment. Um, I have not built uh, one of these personally. I just know that other groups have. Um, we aren't fixed on the... Um, the 30 micron fiber size. You know, the DESI fibers that we use are 110 microns. Uh, of course, that would reduce the spatial sampling um, that we have available, but that would be part of this trade study that we'd have to look at. Okay, thank you. You don't have anything like what he just described on DESI, do you? No, we don't. But the, um, the Phobos instrument that I'm working on, we do. But yeah, no, we have no IFU on DESI. It's uh, okay. So it's it's only because we have this lens system in front of the fiber of the fibers that we may have that. Mm -hmm. But you know, instruments like uh, PFS have micro lenses on their fibers, but they're obviously much bigger. Mm -hmm. But that would be a really interesting trade study to look at fiber size and micro lenses. And that's why we have that in this proposal. And we're actually meeting uh, with LBL today to uh, figure out if we can get an LDRD to look at uh, just these issues. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, we move on to the next talk by Yuzi Galvani uh, on Latino science, cosmology from Calar Alto. So hello, Luis, are you there? Okay, so can you share your screen, please? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, you can start, yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for staying there to the last talk. Uh, I'm going to present the science that we, the Latino uh, Consortium, plan to do with the instrument that uh, Claire just presented. Uh, you may recognize some names here. Uh, there's people as I will I will show later. Uh, I'll describe the Latino Consortium, institutions from Andalusia, from Spain, from Europe, and, and from uh, America, the States, and Chile. Uh, this is the overview of my talk. I will start describing the main science goal to measure local universe peculiar velocities 
uh, then I will I will describe how Latino will do that. Uh, I will end just listing a, a number of secondary science cases that the, the consortium has uh, identified. Doable with uh, and as I said, I will finish with the with the consortium. So uh, just to start from the beginning, in a homogeneous and isotropic universe. The redshift of, of galaxies uh, would be only used to, to the cosmological expansion. However, uh, the universe is neither homogeneous and isotropic. So, um, this, there are they have uh, it has small scale energy density fluctuations, as it's shown in this plot from Tully uh, et al. from last year. Uh, they use the redshift of the spectroscopic redshift of uh, catalog galaxies which are shown in uh, in white dots here and they found these over densities and voids over densities uh, plotted here in red and green colors and voids in blue the difference from the from the redshift to the expected uh, velocity from the from due to expansion they found these these uh, structures and these velocity flows uh, uh, represented here in these white lines, and uh, um, and this revealed, revealed networks of structure. Uh, but measuring these peculiar velocities, one can uh, can uh, get or can uh, get this representation and reconstruct the the velocity maps. Uh, so the peculiar velocities of these galaxies are due to gravitational pulls. Of these over densities in the in the local universe. So, um, CMB provides a measurement of how big and where these perturbations were at the early universe. So one one just needs a theory of gravity to calculate how they evolve at later times at at relative zero. The the evolution uh, of these perturbations can be parameterized using the growth function and and its uh, and its derivative to the cosmological scale factor. And in particular, uh, Eric Linder found uh, in, in this paper in 2005 that a different models of gravity could be described by this uh, gamma parameter and th in this expression. So in this plot, I show um, a different theories of gravity. You see here in, in blue, general relativity and uh, popular modified gravity models, FR and DGP. And uh, also uh, state-of-the-art results uh, measuring these uh, these parameters using red space red, um, red space distortions. Sorry, uh, and also includes forecasts from Desi, uh, as you can see in the in the gray shadow curve. Um, however, uh, these these red space distortions are not able to to get a measurement at a redshift lower than 0.2 because the density of, of galaxies is too low. Uh, but fortunately, there's another way to measure peculiar velocities, and it's using the distance uh, estimations from supernova 1A, from type 1A supernova. And this is what, what Latino, uh, what we with Latino uh, aim to do. Uh, I, I, let me, I forgot to say that it's in this regime where these uh, different uh, gravity models uh, are give different uh, different answers, and is in this regime where just being a measurement will be able to distinguish between models. So, Taiwan and supernovae are are very very well known distance indicators are are, pres are very precise and mature. Uh, basically, how it works is that the light curves, Taiwan A light curves, can be standardized. And using the the peak magnitude of these of uh, their light curves, we can measure distance. On the right, you can see uh, one of the latest uh, Hubble diagrams um, from the et al. 2014. At high redshift, uh, these distances are sensitive to the to the relative components of the universe. Uh, basically, here is where uh, using this technique. In the in the 90s, the late 90s, it was discovered the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, is at low redshifts, 
where these distances or these measurements are sensitive to peculiar velocities. So uh, at, is at, at this regime where the, the distance of the supernova can be distinguished from the conformal distance due to expansion. However, the current sample of, of type 1 A's is too low at, red, at these low red chips, uh, is of the order of 200-300 available. Uh, but this is now changing. First, because there are uh, new ways to standardize better uh, type 1A supernovae. Uh, classic methods use, use the multicolor light curves, multi wavelength light curves. And as I explained that, uh, before, we just standardize the light curves using some parameters and reduce the, the intrinsic uh, um, scatter down to 0.14 magnitudes at peak. Recently, uh, using uh, new lear machine learning techniques, uh, we are able to measure these distances uh, just with one spectra at maximum. Uh, th this is an example of, uh, of a paper by Kyle Boone uh, from this year, where here you see that the, there is uh, uh, um, the, at different epochs, so those were will be considered good twins. And on the right, you see those that are not as good as the, the ones on the left. So using, using the um, spectrophotometric uh, libraries of well-observed supernovae, and then one single spectrum at maximum of, the, of new supernova and looking for a good twin, we could, be, we could measure the distance to, to this new supernova uh, and reduce down to 0.08 magnitudes with a single spectrum. So improving the, the standardization. But also, uh, currently and in the next future, uh, this, uh, there will be, or there, is, there are surveys that are discovering uh, new transients uh, with large numbers. Uh, for example, ZTF uh, is being in the, in, the, in the northern hemisphere with two bands, G and R, uh, also in the third band uh, with less cadence, and is discovering or has discovered 2,000 supernovae at this low redshift in the last three years. There is plans for uh, ZTF2, which will start late this, later this year, which will improve the number uh, by a factor of three. And there are plans already for CDF3 that will start in 2024. Um, also, uh, in the south, there will be LSST planned for starting next year, at the end of next year for 10 years, which will provide uh, larger numbers, even larger numbers. So even uh, LSST that is in the south, there's still a band uh, where uh, objects can be observed from color out. Uh, once the feeder surveys uh, discover all these new transients, when we have to make use of these uh, transient brokers, uh, which are uh, like uh, large uh, machine learning uh, algorithms that compile, score, and, and provide the best tar targets uh, to be uh, observed in this case for us, but for, for the community, depending on the science case they are interested in. This is an example of Alerce, which uh, they are in our consortium in Latino, but there are also in the market Ampel uh, from ZTF, Antares, LSST, and Laser. Most of them, uh, or most of the work that they do is the same. They just compile the alerts from these feeder surveys and apply some preliminary classification. So we are, uh, with the score that they provide, we have uh, the best objects that we can later uh, trigger Latino and get the spectrum at maximum. Uh, this is, um, as, as Claire just described, uh, this is a, a simulated Larino data in a squared uh, form instead of hexagonal, but, but still. Uh, Latino will be a 100% coverage field of view of 12 uh, times 12 uh, or around more than 10 squared uh, arc seconds. This is useful because it includes the supernova uh, and the environment, and also some uh, lenses will cover the sky. Uh, what we have been 
proposing in the right now and in the feasibility proposal, as Claire said, this may change, but the special resolution is about uh, half a second. Uh, this is useful because on the right, on the bottom right plot, you will see the a simulated image of the galaxy and the supernova in the center. And with this uh, spatial resolution, we are able to sample the PCF. So the spectral resolution that we we thought was uh, we planned was around thousand, which is enough to resolve all the broad features of supernovae. And the wavelength coverage is three seven to nine three hundred Armstrongs. Uh, this, is, this can be changed uh, if we move from three to two arms, but it covers all important supernova features that are needed for standardization and to find good twins. Uh, it will be spectrophotometric. Claire also mentioned that in the, in the focal plane, there will be a, a camera that will uh, monitor the, the sky and the transmission. Uh, also, we are able to recover the PCF. So we want all the photons that come to the supernova um, but in uh, in addition to that, we are we got the since some of the members in in our consortium are members of CTF and LSST, so we have a backup, and we will get also the light curves of of these objects. Oh, this is just an, another example. This is how all that will work in just one slide so feeder on the top left feeder transients uh, will discover the objects uh, will produce these light curves in different bands brokers will tell us which ones are more reliable so more uh, mm, close to a 1a or more sure that the classific the, that the object will be a 1a and also will tell us um, when the the peak will occur so with these scores, we will trigger uh, Latino at, at the Caral Alto Observatory at the 2.2. We will get the data. Uh, this is a, a simulated data of a, a simulated uh, observation uh, uh, of We will get the spectrum of the supernova in red. We will also get some sky and, and also the host for environmental studies. And with this, when we sample, uh, we uh, get all these thousands of, of objects, we will be able to, to put our measurement and test the different uh, gravity models. So for that, a Latino uh, will need high signal to noise spectra of a supernovae, and it will be able to get data uh, at declination northern from uh, minus 20 degrees. Uh, this supernovae at the redshift that we are estimating will have magnitudes at peak brighter than, minus, than 19 magnitudes. And as estimated by ZTF, this corresponds to around 1,700 supernova per year. Uh, making numbers, doing the numbers, is this is uh, 120 clear nights per year. So in three years, we will have, we will be, or in, in hand, uh, we will have 5,000 supernovae wale that will be able to produce uh, a measurement of the growth of structure at low at low redshift with a 7% precision, and will be the state of the art measurement, uh, and will be able to distinguish uh, among uh, um, gravity models to 95% confidence. Um, I just wanted to highlight that this uh, science, peculiar the measurement of peculiar velocities uh, from type 1 supernovae, was identified as one of the science needs for the next decade in the Astro 2020 survey and also in the French uh, equivalent survey by several papers. And here I show I just show one uh, a figure of one of them from Dan Skolnik, where. It summarizes what the future of supernova one cosmology would be in the next decade, and one of the the, the ways to to get uh, use uh, to get uh, use of what type one is is be a peculiar velocities and measure the the growth of structure at at low redshifts. Um, within the consortium, we also included in the proposal a number of. Uh, other science cases that we could do or the community would be able to do with this instrument. Basically, all of them that, that require spectrophotometric uh, data. 
and, and spatial resolution. Uh, I will just mention, well, all, some are supernova related, just uh, following up uh, peculiar or, or very interesting supernovae. Uh, use this spectra to improve supernova and standardization. As I said, we get this environment and the galaxy as well, so we can do uh, things that we have done uh, in the past with Khalifa, for example, or with Pisco. Uh, we can improve uh, the Hubble constant, constant measurement uh, using the Cephate and, uh, and Supernova Distance Ladder by uh, calibrating better Cephates using metallicities at the locations. We can also use uh, Latino to, to or the, the, the IFU, the high uh, throughput IFU to get images of strongly, strongly lensed supernovae. Uh, I would mention as well uh, gravitational uh, wave uh, counterparts. As well, this would get uh, the full spectrophotometric uh, data of, of, the, of the counterpart and the host. We can uh, use it to also to observe uh, dwarf galaxies or H2, large H2 regions in nearby galaxies. And all this is described, uh, as I said, in the in the proposal. But the, the, the point here is that it's an IFU for the 2.2 that currently it doesn't have it. Uh, and it will be useful for several several science cases. Uh, the Latino Consortium, we were, we were able to put uh, together these 12 uh, institutions, people from these 12 institutions that are world experts in supernova science and cosmology. Uh, with key contributions, including the actual discovery of the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, so there's experience there. Some of these institutions have experience as well and in building astronomical and also other instrumentation. And of course, we have experience in data processing, not only in supernova and software development. So in summary, we propose a Latino low cost, around 2 million euros, low risk, because most of the hardware is already available. There doesn't need to be a lot of, of design. Uh, this is an instrument for the 2.2 to measure a peculiar velocities in the local units. We plan to obtain around 1,700 supernova per year uh, to reach at least the number of 5,000, uh, so three years. Uh, to put constraints in different models of, of gravity. Uh, as I said, this uh, science case is recognized as uh, important for the, for the next decade, and uh, Latino will, will help put in Caja Caralato in the scientific forefront next decade in, of the next decade cosmology analysis. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Luis, uh, we have here a question, a remote question from Jens Helmling. Uh, which is the size and weight for Latino? You <laughs> are. I guess the, uh, unfortunately, the people who know the answer to that are not. <laughs> They've actually left the room so I can uh, run and find the answer for you. But just to be clear, the instrument itself, the spectrograph itself, the heavy things are going to be placed in the CUDE room. So they won't be attached to the telescope. I don't know if that was the motivation for the question. Um, I, I don't I actually don't know what is the question. I don't see here any question. What was the question? No, which is the, the weight and the size of, of Latino? Spectrograph, yeah. Yeah, so there's in the picture in, in, oh. in, in um, Claire's uh, presentation, there was a picture of the spectrograph with a dimension. And if I remember correctly, it's something on the order of uh, meters. So yeah. let me, uh, if I can find that. I think uh, maybe, one maybe one uh, I can go back. What meters? And the idea is that it wouldn't, it would be, you know, it would just be fixed in the Coudet room. So I don't think, I'm not sure that what the issue is with mass, but it would not be attached to the, the telescope focus. Okay. More questions, please. So 
Uh, if you don't have more questions, we end here our first uh, first day of the workshop. So thanks all for being there. And tomorrow we will start at quarter past nine in the morning for the two last sessions. Okay? So... Uh, yeah, yeah, and and we should uh, end around twelve, something like this, twelve, twelve thirty, something like this. Okay, so thank you all again, and see you tomorrow. <laughs>